Hi, this is Justin Oaksford, and you're about to watch a process video showing my typical process for doing a character sketch. Just to lay a few things out, this is not a lecture video. There may be some theory discussion, but we probably won't dig too deep. This video will mostly be a discussion about how I approach these pieces and why I make some of the decisions that I do. With that, let's start. So right off the bat here, you can see I started with a beige canvas. Uh, mostly painters like doing this so they can see relative value better when they're putting down strokes. Uh, I do it to reduce eye strain personally. Um, so the first third of this video is mostly me struggling. Um, this, it was very intentional for me to leave this in, in the final product and talk about it. Um, because part of why I show this preliminary stuff is because this is what art is like. Um, it's not easy. I spend so much time ripping my hair out about what to draw before finally finding the subject I end up executing on. There is a, always a caveat I like to mention with any process demo about, about this kind of thing. And I notice that a lot of younger artists often ask some variation of the question, do you see what you're going to draw before you draw it? And I've heard at least two professionals laugh at that question, uh, and a lot of others who simply shrug it off with kind of a, no, of course not, that's dumb. Um, as I've kind of come into my own a bit, and found my own answer to that question, I realized that the students were often asking two separate questions without realizing it, but the professionals or teachers were only answering one of them. What they were actually asking is, A, can you see the final piece before you start working? And B, can you see what mark you're going to make before you make it? Well, A, seeing the final piece can vary some people can get very strong and particular inspirational bursts. I think a general consensus among professionals would be that, no, this isn't something that you should expect to be able to do. B, however, seeing the mark on the page is extremely important. It's something that becomes intuitive over time as you get a firmer grasp on both your tools and fundamentals. When things like anatomy and perspective uh, become instinct, you can focus on design. How do you stylize the anatomy? How do you emphasize weight or expression? Those things are hard to do well when you're struggling with making the anatomy and perspective right in the first place. I bring this all up because with any professional demo you watch, any of them, many of the movements can seem really opaque or magical. The way to think about it is that when you've gotten good enough, you know how to set yourself up for successes. You may understand the first few steps of these demonstrations, but then something happens and you're left scratching your head. That's usually when the artist has made decisions early on to simplify things for themselves so they can skip those steps that you kind of expect to see in the process. That's at least in part why I'm showing all the stuff I threw in the trash. The final drawing wasn't something I just started on and it came out perfect. It took a significant amount of failure before I even started heading in the right direction. To elaborate a little bit, there are currently two approaches I take when drawing. The first I call straight ahead, which is an animation term which you can roughly think of as spontaneous or stream of consciousness style sketching. I think a lot of people would just call it contour sketching. Ostensibly it's when you start with a final line and you draw the contour of your subject with a supreme confidence. It can be extremely fun uh, and lead you to really wonderfully dynamic solutions you might not have come up with otherwise in terms of shape design and gesture. However, it also very strongly relies on your fundamentals to make something appealing and not just awkwardly broken. Ironically, while it's great for discovery and spontaneity, it also often has a tendency to exacerbate someone's flaws. I have seen a number of artists who draw like this, who tend to draw the same faces, the same angles, the same shapes over and over and over again because of that lack of grasp on fundamentals. You can actually see right here where I'm kind of doing a little bit of both. Uh, I'm not really trying to get a final silhouette, but I'm, I was using those single confident lines instead of, I mean, I guess I was using them to mass out the shape itself. Um, I guess the other approach, which I, I tend to more often take, which you'll see in this video, is what I refer to as structural drawing or, or analytical drawing. 
um, which is the idea that as you s you start as absolutely general as possible with the largest masses blocked out first, slowly chiseling and sculpting your silhouette uh, and your interior forms. While it may sound kind of restricting, it's actually extremely liberating. It's also really useful for staying on model and is how a lot of the classic Disney animators chose to draw. It's also how I tend to approach everything in this video. Uh, while it may feel static and maybe limiting, uh, it actually helps you to refine your sense of form, direction, uh, sense of 3D space and volume, and can honestly give you a great base to start off of to push your designs really far out, uh, farther out than you normally would. In a way, I often do a mix of both. I enjoy the discovery in the straight ahead method, but the accuracy and reliability of the structural. Uh, doing one helps me to do the other, I find. So here, as you can see, I'm trying to figure out this bird warrior thing. You could see that it started with a bunch of abstract lines and scribbles, then trying to pull the silhouette and forms out of that. That kind of technique is a mix of what some people call chaos theory or pattern recognition. The idea being that our brains are wonderful at seeing basically seeing faces or other objects inside of an ambiguous pattern. This was something I learned from Bob Cotto, one of my favorite teachers, actually. Um, I, I think many of you might be familiar with the idea of hierarchies in images, large to small, soft to hard, thick to thin. He introduced us to the idea of abstract versus concrete, wherein you build your image from extreme abstraction at first and you layer on what he called our control stuff. In other words, using our fundamentals to rein in the abstraction to make a representational image. Uh, as Sparth, uh, Nicolas Bouvier, uh, often says, you have to break your brain. You'll always be limited by what your brain thinks is possible, so you have to give it fuel to make leaps that you couldn't build yourself. So an addendum to that, as you can see here, is pulling in reference. It might seem opposed to the idea of complete abstraction, but the goals, I think, are really the same. You're giving your brain more information to work with, whether it's completely abstract imagination fodder, or in this case, extremely concrete imagery. In both cases, you're riffing off of your context. Uh, reference is great in that while it builds a sense of realism and solidity that you can lean on, that solidity gives you a oh, great scaffolding you can start building off of while still maintaining that suspension of disbelief. In this case, the reference kind of helped me curate my shapes to reflect a more accurate anatomy. But with that backing, I felt more free to push shapes to their extremes for a more interesting silhouette. A good thing to keep in mind with this is if you make something thin, make it really thin. If you make something big, make it really big. You can always walk backwards, walk it backwards, but it's better to go too far than not far enough. So here you can see I'm mostly just refining the shapes, kind of using the reference and trying to reconstruct the anatomy of the leg um, by figuring out where the bones are. Um, a lot of kind of anger, I think. You, you, I don't know if you, you probably can't really pick it up without seeing my face or hearing my voice from the original recording, but I was very frustrated with this. Whenever I have to, whenever I erase things over and over again, I'm getting progressively angrier usually. Um, I'm trying really hard to make this, this sketch work, some kind of interesting pose, but I'm quickly running into a brick wall where I realize that this isn't, this is not going to be a successful sketch. Um, maybe on some other night I could have turned it into a good one, um, but I was just not really feeling, I wasn't, I guess to a certain point what I mentioned earlier about seeing the finished piece, after I got per ostensibly done with the sketch, I couldn't really see the appeal of it, of what it would be when it was done, and I realized that I w I, it would be a struggle for me to force myself to finish it, which I don't avoid that, but in personal work, when it's a struggle, it usually means that I'm not inspired by it. 
And it, that usually means the result won't be inspirational either. Um, there's kind of a myth that I've heard often repeated that uh, the first 80% of anything super sucks and it's only the last like 20 or 10% when it really comes together. And I honestly don't really believe in that the way a lot of people do. Um, there's a lot of cases where it's true, but in my personal work, I strive, uh, something I heard from David Levy a long time ago, vile art, um, concept artist on, on Tron and Prince of Persia and all these amazing things. Um, he used to say, if your thumbnail isn't inspiring, don't go past it because you have to work on this thing for like 30 more hours if it's an illustration. And if your thumbnail isn't inspiring, the comp isn't going to be inspiring. And if the comp isn't inspiring, you're not going to be inspired to work on it to final. Um, and I've tried to always maintain that, that I, that philosophy as much as I can, where I, in the very early stages, try to fail a lot, fail often as, as you might hear, um, to try to get to an inspirational beginning that will, through love, push me through the entire process. So here I started with this large, simple mass, this kind of rhythmic shape, um, and the small punctuating shape in front of it that became a head. Um, started thinking of something like a Hercules beetle or some kind of beetle warrior, so it evolved into that. Again, this is kind of the combination of confident and structural uh, drawing approaches where it's a little bit finding silhouette in the very beginning, but right now it kind of has gone back to kind of trying to build some of the understructure, make sure the perspective is correct and that there's interesting overlaps. It's, it's funny looking back at these failures because I can see potential in them now, but at the time I was fighting a feeling of uncreativity super hard. Um, as you can see by the constant erasure. And there's just this silence here, which is me just kind of paralyzed. Like, what am I gonna do? Like, I have no ideas. I can't draw anything. And it just kind of sat there. You know, I tried to force myself to draw a face or something, which won't pan out. You'll see in a couple seconds. But a lot of this, I even actually cut some of it out because it was too long. Um, and this was live again, like it was kind of embarrassing at the time. Funnily, actually a lot of people logged on for all the failures, then logged off, and then I did the bats. And they, when they saw it, they were like, wait, this isn't what you did in the stream. Um, but yeah, this, this long silence here is me silently like covering up the microphone and just being like, damn, 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 I'm so brain dead right now. And then... I sat and thought kind of quietly about what I wanted to draw. And I finally kind of had that serendipitous moment of like, ah, oh, bats are cool. And what if there was this like old bat reading to a younger bat? And I started with the sphere like I did before and just building features super loose. So this approach is kind of structural it's this is really i think the way i start most of my stuff where it's um very contoury trying to get things down at first knowing it's i mean it's a rough sketch it's basically a thumbnail where i do have this this little twinkle of an idea and i want to put it all down and get it dressed really before i i kind of lose it um so you can see like i didn't really block out the whole scene before i drew the book I just like, I know he's going to be on a lap and I know the kid's going to be there. I don't know what the body's going to be like, but I'll figure it out. And it was very hasty, but it's kind of gratifying when you, you can hang out, you latch onto this thing that was so hard to get to, but finally it's starting to, to come. You can see right there, I was kind of excited about the hand shapes, like if he's going to be turning the page or whatnot. There's a lot of, a lot of searching. Like I have this, this framework now in mind, especially now that I have the head and the other head and the book, it's a lot of exploring the relationship between the two heads, uh, making sure his eye gaze is there and what is the attitude of the kid, 
Uh, is he mid-story reading it? Again, a lot of this, which which isn't shown, is really the fundamental aspect of it. Before I called it kind of skipping steps, but it's a lot of the drawing volumes and symmetrical ears and slight twinges of expression, things that I kind of build in to expand upon later. Trying to add character through adding props, glasses. Getting really into the hand shapes there. Uh, there, that's actually a really good example of the straight ahead approach where I kind of am, I really enjoy drawing hands and in a way I, I feel like I can sometimes draw them better when I go right in for it instead of uh, constructing them out. But I think, I mean, I constructed them out a lot beforehand in school and, and life drawing uh, to be able to do that. But it does produce a really nice effect when you do it all in one line. And now I'm getting generally happy with the shape of the sofa and the way the, the silhouette works overall. With the scene, it feels kind of self-contained. The book supports the bottom of, of, or kind of the middle of the image, but it keeps the focus up on their faces. So I apologize that the, I'm not talking as much about shape design and shape language and that kind of character design theory. Um, a lot of that I prefer to do with a more chalkboard approach live where I can draw custom diagrams and show examples. Uh, this I feel like is a little bit more, I mean, it's, it's definitely more process focused. One thing I did enjoy about this sketch, about the work, working on it, because about from here it's pretty much downhill and it moves on to inking pretty quickly. I think we have a tendency as artists to, I mean, not as artists, just as people, we, we kind of accidentally do easy things uh, because they're less scary. So we'll draw, usually just draw faces when we're bored, or we'll just draw one single character. But there's a really nice dynamic and drama that you can get when you push further into having a little bit of setting, a prop or two, and some, you know, more than one character. And one thing that this helped me, you know, let me do, which was really nice, was I have two characters. I have two props if you include the sofa and the book, three if you include the rug, which is not really a prop. Um, but it really let me explore a relationship in a small moment, uh, without animating or, you know, having to do storyboarding or play with camera. I feel like as a concept artist, uh, there's a tendency to do this kind of visual masturbation where you're drawing one cool thing and trying to make it as cool as possible. But I've always felt a bit limited by static images. Uh, and I'm realizing now all these ways that people have known for hundreds of years how to, to fix that or, or to create more involvement without actually having words attached to the image or a history attached to the image, which is simply, you know, showing the interaction of, of two or more figures. Um, which I think is also why this sketch took off is as soon as I, I realized I like could draw two things interacting and what those two things would be it made my life a lot easier. Uh, so now we're in the inking phase, and you can see right there how I was kind of comparing my the shapes that I inked, the shapes that I penciled, because people complain a lot about the loss of life in inks, where the rough, uh, like, oh, the rough sketch had so much more life than the, the cleanup. And I actually, again, this might sound repetitive, but that's something that I attribute to fundamentals, where if your fundamentals are really strong, you tend to improve the drawing with the inks and the cleanup. It really adds this solidity and, and intention to it. But if you can't really capture what your loose shapes were, it kind of indicates to me that the loose shapes were born out of luck and not out of intention. Uh, so you kind of, this sounds rude, but you, you didn't really deserve the, you know, the nice clean shapes that you had in your rough uh, if you can't clean them up. You know, and some people just prefer to work rough, which is totally fine. Um, but this is, yeah, figuring out the mouth shape that I didn't quite pencil in there and how much anatomy to put in, how much to leave out. Um, I definitely, with, with animation, it's always a battle f between simplicity and detail. 
Um, I almost always err on the side of simplicity on eliminating as many curves, eliminating as many uh, like divots and angles as I possibly can. Um, for example, right there, you can see there's kind of this clean arc that I just made between the eyebrow and the nose so that there's one clean line that radiates around the eye and it really helps pull focus into the pupil and hold it there. It's, it's a very intentional kind of composition that uh, drafts people have done for hundreds of years. Um, Milt Call always did it particularly well. I was really struggling with those nostrils, how to make them indicative, but also somewhat actually bat-like. Um, but you'll see a lot of cases here where I simplify the rough and I try to find long sweeping lines that help lead the eye towards the points of focus. The eyes between the two of them, the hands, points of interaction. And it's kind of, it provides this feeling when you look at the drawing of completion or of, of wholeness, unity, uh, as you might call it, where the elements work together and talk to each other. You can have exceptional anatomy and perspective and shapes, but if you fail to stage it well, if the elements contradict and interrupt each other, your image suffers for it. This is something you definitely develop through experience. The time you spend looking at and creating images helps you become more familiar with uh, what tools you have to move the eye around. As you get comfortable with that vocabulary in the realm of imagination, you can start to observe it from life and begin pulling that kind of curated elegance into your life drawings, which will feed back into your work. One thing I'd like to mention is specificity or intent. It's probably one of the things that students are most likely to overlook. Actually, ironically, even people who are known for having too much detail in their work are still guilty of being vague or careless. A high frequency of detail is more often a sign of insecurity than it is of, of having strong intentions. Intent, by the way, is, is a word that I often use in place of design. I like it because it kind of insinuates a high level of control over every part of your image. Think of like drawing letter forms in typography. That's a skill that requires incredible amounts of intent. The spacing between the letters and words, the relative thicknesses of the letter forms as they taper in and out. You have to control the acceleration of every turn and make sure the outlines are crisp and mechanically graceful. You need this same level of dexterity and intent with your drawings. Intent is the difference between drawing hands versus drawing a 50-year-old desert nomad's hands versus drawing a baby's hands. It's the layers of history and environment that you cake onto your structure, which must then be composed into your drawing on top of that. The way it manifests in this drawing in particular can be seen in the knobs of the old bat's hands, the perk of his ears, or the way the young bat is holding their ears out of fear. Uh, it's a step beyond just existing. It's the full utilization of your elements of your picture to tell a story. The legs offset to support the weight of the storybook, the carpet with its slight wrinkles, the far hand preparing to corner the page, the very slight recoil of the neck demonstrating incredulity with the raised eyebrow. It's where you show materials, things crinkled or resting upon each other. In short, Intent is the pinnacle of showing instead of telling. It brings to life characters in a way a screenplay can't. Part of the way I think about sketches like this are that the sketch is built entirely around moments. To go back to the specificity thing, the moments in a drawing are the parts which can give you a descriptor. For example, a few lines can indicate whether the fit of a shirt is tailored or baggy, it can tell you if someone's knees are bent or if their muscle is flexing, if they're grimacing, if they're clenching a fist or splaying their hand, uh, if their foot is ready to push off or lazily rocking on their heel. Uh, I said a second ago that intent is utilizing all of your elements to tell a story. I'm really just echoing that. Moments are when you take a normal thing, arm, sock, toe, shirt, book, 
and you think of how you can edit it, tweak it into a more description, more descriptive version of itself. There's also this huge aspect of acting. I should reiterate that I am by no means an animator. I just happen to spend a lot of time around animators and around animation. But animators really are actors. Uh, they have to be. They are, they are completely authoring performances from the ground up. Granted, acting is infinitely more crucial to moving images than static ones, but acting can take your regular character drawings from something completely forgettable and average to heartfelt and sincere. Acting is, is kind of like emotional detail. Your choices can reveal a whole lot about the mental life of your character, even if they have no backstory. In a way, it's the combination of uh, external elements, including the shape and posture and design of the character, indications about the setting, combined with the context of the internal elements. How are they reacting to, the, to their environment? What does that reveal about them? Uh, environment including other characters. Uh, and it's those internal elements that give, it's a combination of those external and internal elements that give a character depth and definition and makes them intriguing for an audience to engage with. You can see me going through the little bats design, trying all kinds of, well, of their little bats acting choices, really trying all kinds of different things, yawning, dozing off, smiling excitedly about the, the storybook. It was actually pretty difficult to figure out who the kid was, um, but I, did, I found, it, found it eventually. And I just hope it goes to show again, even when I'm refining this sketch, so many things are in flux. It's important to be patient and give your brain the time and space it needs to consider, extrapolate, and make dec decisions about your work. I'm sure you're all familiar with the saying, the devil's in the details. While detail itself is obviously important, I want to take a second to focus on the craft aspect of that, because that's what I think that phrase is really about. Not details that are decorative, but rather how fine the craftsmanship is. Think less doorknobs and more... Does the door scrape against the door jam or floor, or is it smooth? This goes back again to fundamentals. I know this topic is often visited, but it's never enough. I want it to sink in. There's really no substitute for good fundamentals, and you'll be really surprised how often the most rudimentary basic knowledge will surface out of nowhere and give you some giant epiphany about how you approach your work. With art, we all hear a lot of the same rules pretty early on, but it's only through hearing them over and over and seeing them applied in an infinite number of scenarios that we can truly appreciate the idea behind the rules that we hear. As an example, um, you might have noticed a few minutes ago I lasso tooled the hand resting on the book to go from kind of on top of the book to laying flat against it. Like it kind of goes below the ridge of the book. That's actually a really good example of this. I originally drew the hand where it would be shown off the most, careless, kind of carelessly. The result being this awkward and obvious lie about how the book lies on his lap. By simply transforming the hand's position to where it belongs, by following the rules of perspective and respecting the truth I, I established in the image, it really helped solidify the drawing. Every drawing is filled with dozens of those kinds of opportunities. And I'm sure I've missed my fair share as well in this own in this sketch alone. But you need to always be vigilant and do your best to catch yourself in those small lapses of judgment. That kind of self-scrutiny will lead you to many great moments of self-learning that you can take with you onto the next illustrations. You can see here I'm really starting to refine the expression on the kid. Moving the eye gaze around, trying different mouth shapes, adding the small cheek puff, pushing up over his eye trying to work through and figure out what his current state of mind is and how to reflect that in the drawing. Is he, so, is he so scared he's looking away? If he was that scared, wouldn't making eye contact help him feel more secure? And you can see I was playing with the ears a bit too. I felt they were really symmetrical, so I tried a bunch of things to break them. I pushed them back on his head, perked them up again. Make sure to deviate from your rough when you feel you can make it better. I kept lowering the ears over and over, which eventually led me to the thought of, how can I get them just to be straight down? I could bring some amount of specificity or emotional detail to them, making them a moment, 
which actually sets up the pose for the whole character. I feel like that was probably the biggest win for me on this piece, the, the ear grabbing. Anytime you can give your character's hands something really specific to do or interact with, even if, if it's as simple as waving hello or snapping their finger, you should. Don't make it broad or overacted. Keep it subtle, but try to give it some activity that can give insight. It's that thing with cigarettes, right? It gives you something to do with your hand that adds interest. So try to think of something, anything, that isn't hand resting at side or hand on waist or hand in pocket. If you do have to draw hands on waist, it better be a really good hand and the figure better be drawn resting weight on one leg really well. And if, if it's in your pocket, there better be a really good reason for it. Actually, just for reference, I think one of the best examples I can give is if you look up Sergio Pablos's pencil tests for Dr. Doppler from Treasure Planet, you can take almost any individual drawing from those tests and it's brilliant on its own. But watching it in a, as a sequence, you can see the hands changing position, being active. Even if it's just putting on a coat, his hands are remarkably expressive without being distracting. They really feel real. You can also see how much time I'm spending just on that hand to get it right. But a well-drawn hand can really carry a drawing. I think most of you have probably heard during a figure drawing session or from a teacher to watch for overlaps, which is a lot of what I'm dealing with in this part of the image. And to be clear, I'm not talking about overlapping action like you find in animation. I would also use the term foreshortening. Depending on your experiences, you may have heard one or the other, but they both imply the same thing. Foreshortening is when something is heading toward you, you the camera at least, and giving it an often difficult sense of perspective. But here's the trick. Figure drawing, or drawing anything really, is about an illusion. We're drawing things on a 2D plane, usually, not always, trying to convince the audience that something is 3D, that it has depth. There are certain things you can do that give your drawing that appearance of depth, and overlaps and or foreshortening is really the bulk of it. In school, we had some really hardcore perspective classes, which were kind of a blessing in disguise. I mean, the perspective drawing skill on its own is infinitely useful without a doubt, but it forces you to overlap items outside of any prescribed context. You're just relying on the math of the perspective grid to place things in space. But I think people start to realize, especially while drawing more organic forms in perspective, is that that sense of space you start to be able to just place objects in the space and the overlaps kind of write themselves into the picture. It was a good case of compartmentalizing study for me by abstracting the concept of overlaps, which are usually only demonstrated in context with the human figure. I could focus on refining my actual sense of space where sometimes fastening a concept like overlaps to a specific context, i.e. the human figure can help people to develop a common shorthand but may in the long run stop them from understanding space and other parts of image making. One thing that applies to both this part of the process, inking, as well as painting, is mark making, or economy of line. With either line or paint, it's crucial to understand the amount of information every mark can convey. Every mark can carry with it perspective information, indication of texture, a sense of weight or compression, anatomical information, as well as expression of emotion. You can frame the idea of stroke economy by saying, don't use two marks where one will do. Part of what this accomplishes is building a visual hierarchy, as I mentioned before. If you notice in this drawing, there are a series of long and broken lines that lead to points of smaller, higher frequency lines. I should say this drawing is definitely not a great example of economical mark making, but I'm gonna reference Milt Call, uh, K-A-H-L, uh, the old Disney animator, if you look at his drawings, you can see how cleanly he structures the large unbroken lines to lead to the face and hands where the most expression and, inter and interaction occur. He eliminates or streamlines details to always push to those focal points. On the topic of focal points and leading the eye, you probably saw me playing around with the eye direction earlier. You should never let your eyes go to waste. One of the reasons I chose to have the two of them share eye contact is that the eyes are one of the most strongly empathetic bonds we have with images. If a character is looking at something or in a direction, 
Your eyes track it to see what they're looking at. When two characters make eye contact, even if it's implicit, say if a character is facing away from the camera, it really successfully captures the audience's interest. Even though the abstract shape of the eyes isn't an arrow or a leading line, we still feel compelled to follow it. Make sure to use this to your advantage. Play with the eyelids as an, and iris and pupil coverage as well. Take selfies of different expressions and really spend time trying to figure out what the primary visual elements of, the, of those expressions are. I'm going to go off on another tangent here, so forgive me, but speaking about hands and feet and eyes again, when I look at student work, there's usually one very large difference I see that tells me a lot about the student, and that's if the student draws what they're bad at or scared of. So often, a student, a student work, student's work is a lot of heads or busts with maybe occasional hands visible, usually in a very neutral pose or obscured in some way by clothes or armor but very often the hands are stuffed in the pockets or flat out not shown. Other times uh, I see students who are not great at drawing, but they draw the entire figure often with hands and bodies doing complex and expressive things. That is nine times out of 10 going to be a more successful artist. That is nine times out of 10 going to be a more successful artist. They're more concerned with saying something in the image, where often the former students who hide the hands in their drawings are more concerned with looking good on a superficial level among their peers than actual substance in the image. I am making a bit of a value judgment here. In truth, there's nothing wrong with enjoying superficial things, but I would argue that it's preferable to be aware of this dichotomy and grow from it. Indulgence and superficiality can typecast you really quickly in the commercial world. This may not be a bad thing if it's something you sincerely enjoy and you can maintain stable employment with it, but it's really up for you to decide. If you value expression, you got to push yourself into those uncomfortable patches so that you can make the most out of your image. It'll also open up adaptability of style and genre for you. Shortcuts that work in one setting will not often work in another. Fundamentals, on the other hand, follow you everywhere. So now we're finally getting into color. While I won't get too deep into color theory, I'll quickly describe the technical process I go through. Here I start out by flatting out the sketch, that is using either a brush or lasso tool or what have you to color inside the lines. This is really just going to be used as a mask. On top of this layer, you use clipping masks, which is when you nest one layer to exist only within the active pixels of another. You make one by taking your base flat layer, that teal color, you make a new layer on top of it, then hold the control and alt keys and click right on the line between the flat base layer and the new empty layer. It should get indented inside that layer with a small arrow. You can stack these masks on top of one base layer. So for each new one, I choose a different material. I'll have one for the shirt, one for the fur, one for the eyes, one for the rug and so on and so forth, all inside that main base flat mask. This also allows a flexibility in the process where I can change the local colors of the materials later when I light the image, which comes in handy very, very often. On the topic of how I choose colors, I should first probably explain that the colors I'm flatting in here are chosen for a really specific reason. Effectively, you can think of it as overcast or diffuse versions of local colors. The reason why is that these colors are the most flexible. They're mild in value and very mild in saturation, and all equally so. What this means is that whether I want to desaturate them or oversaturate them later, they'll all work in unison so you can more effectively organize contrast where you want. The alternative to doing this is painting all your characters as if they were in light with bright high key colors and multiplying a shadow on later, uh, but I find it's harder to do that consistently, especially when teaching people. As far as choosing local, col local colors, uh, also known as you know, material colors, that's up to you. If your lighting is good, you can choose the wackiest possible combinations and it'll still feel believable. The palettes you choose with local colors are more a statement of character or world building. If this were a more formal character design tutorial, I'd go into color blocking and designing casts 
but that's for a later date. You'll also see me put a slightly transparent layer on top of the finished flats to, again, push them down for the sake of contrast, since I know that it's going to be firelit. The way I think about lighting in these sketches is pretty straightforward. Um, it's basically cell shading. I found that in most circumstances, even many soft lit settings, you can find uh, what illustrators and fine artists call the terminator, uh, which is the point on a form where the planes turn away from the light uh, such that light is no longer hitting the plane. Sunlight, spotlights, other direct lights are the easiest to, to see this in but it's possible even on overcast days or in other cases. It's just much more difficult to find then. There really are no special tricks as to choosing what the light looks like as to painting the contours of it. You just have to consider every plane on the volume and if it's facing more towards the light or away from the light, and if it's facing enough away from the light to be effectively completely in shadow. One way to think of this is to imagine a cube and you're lighting the cube. The side plane of it, let's say the left side of the cube, is really bright because it's the most perpendicular to the light. It's receiving the most light. The top plane gets some of the light, but not much, and is clearly not as prominent as the left side. And the right side of the plane is entirely, the right side of the cube is entirely in shadow. Now, for each plane on your drawing, evaluate if it's more of an up facing plane, like the top of the cube, a right facing plane, like this, that right side of the cube or a left facing plane away from the light. Um, oh my God, those directions switched up. One way to think of this is to imagine a sphere. You're lighting the sphere and much like the planet Earth, at a certain point, the planes pass a threshold, the terminator, and are no longer receiving light. It can be tough to figure out where the terminator is on complex volumes, but I always try to imagine the terminator as if it were a contour line itself. It has character and it moves with the geometry and silhouette. That shape, along with the cast shadows that affect it, should all be as sharply designed as the silhouette and volumes of the character itself. The cool thing about cell shading is that it really helps you to ask yourself questions about your form and it also can teach you a little bit about stylizing volumes. You'll learn sometimes that you've drawn an impossible shape and that you need to fix it, or that your, you know, the broad space on one part of your character has a really nice contrast with the details cast on it on the other part of your character. You can see that even the kid bat is casting a shadow on both the chair behind him as well as the old bat's shirt. I'm also using the light to hint at a little thickness on the collar and to show form in the ears that I didn't draw out with the lines. A lot of these shapes, for example the old bat's brow, are lit in a way to emphasize the expression. The shape the shadow makes reinforces the raised brow, continuing to lend focus to the eye. Take note that even the eyeballs and eyelids have shadows on them. This is the kind of higher frequency detail that help draw attention to the eyes while also adding a believability to their form. It's important to understand the relationship to light and form, because often one of the mistakes I, I make and I see others make is that the lighting is completely contradictory to the form that's drawn. The way I tend to describe it is the lighting is lying about the form or silhouette. The silhouette establishes an expectation of what a form looks like in profile. If the light behaves in a way that is contrary or inconsistent with that, it feels unnatural. I think our brains are actually much better than we give them credit for when it comes to seeing lighting, as taking these small measures to make it more accurate can really push a piece to the next level. Uh, we're heading into the home stretch here, uh, and you'll start to see me playing with hue sliders and such. As I said before, one of the huge advantages to working with clipping masks and in layers like this is that you can exercise a very thorough amount of control over values and colors, even in a sort of extreme lighting condition like this where everything is, is very red shifted. The light is all done with screen layers, by the way. Um, I use blending modes to make sure the relationships of all the local colors are maintained. If those color relationships are inconsistent, your lighting will just feel off and unsatisfying. When people say something has good color, almost always what, they're, what they actually mean is it has good lighting, and the good lighting shows the materials and colors under different conditions, allowing the colors to express their full range. 
my favorite example of this are great pictures of mountains at sunset. The rock and snow and trees are all such distinct and shapely groups, and it's so apparent when at sunset, when the trees become a deep reddish, the stone kind of golden orange depending on the type of earth, and the snow moving from gold to yellow in the sunlight. But as soon as it retreats into shadow, it's a stark and powerful aquatic blue. These slight value variations and hue variations between local colors in the same lighting scenario is really satisfying to witness. In the case of this image, it happens with the dark carpet against the spats and shirt, or the slightly different fur hues of the child and old bat, but it's just enough to enjoy. One way of adding more interest to the light using this technique is to make sure your original lighting screen layer is a deeper hue, red in this case, not something bright and specular, uh, and you duplicate the layer, bumping up the brightness a little bit, the saturation a little bit, and pushing the hue more towards a highlight color, in this case uh, from red of the original layer to something more orange-yellow. Um, then you use a soft brush and erase or mask out parts of the new brighter layer so you get a gradient. This mimics the kind of decay that you'll actually observe in real life, where as light gets filtered over a surface or through atmosphere, the hue will get filtered and decay as well. Just like the way that sunsets go from white to yellow to orange to red, and then when the red mixes with the blue of the sky, you get purple. Um, an additional trick on top of this is to take the same base lighting layer, duplicate it again, and put it on top of your line work layer and then Gaussian blur that and play with its opacity. Generally, you want it to be pretty transparent. This gives off that effect of luminosity, which, while a little cheesy when used in moderation, can just lend a bit of softness to an image. It's definitely a stylistic thing that I enjoy doing. You can also then uh, remultiply your line layer back on top of that, and you can paint the lines, uh, color them kind of lower style, or you can play with the contrast to find the ideal balance between seeing the lines and seeing the colors. The cell shading thing is also really great because it's so simple. You can add really small details like speculars on the eyeballs and glasses, and they have a pretty significant impact uh, due to the fact that nothing else ha has that level of detail. This cell shading is this nicely universal application of lighting that I, I personally use on both characters and environments. Um, if you see my YouTube process video from a while back, the small embers uh, that you'll see me at the end of the effects are, are also done on a screen layer, by the way. Um, screen is probably my most used blending mode. I'm, I've really only discovered it in the past two or three years thanks to John Liberto. Um, and it's kind of become a bit of an obsession. So be warned, but it's awesome. Um, so in closing, remember that art is really, really hard, no matter how easy some people make it look. It's also fun and gratifying, but definitely don't feel bad when you're struggling. Everybody does. B, fundamentals. Always. You can always work on them, and it will always ripple throughout every drawing you make. The more you practice, the more brain space you free up to focus on creativity and design. I know a lot of students are scared if they only study that they'll be less creative. While I understand where that comes from because I felt the same way, as long as you're healthily reading, traveling, thinking, and observing, you won't run out of creativity from studying too much. C, this is always kind of a hard thing to convey um, a bit, I guess, but I call it substance over shininess. It's don't think so much about what gets people to look at your image. Think more about what people are taking away from your image. It really is the difference between kind of like a fleeting excitement and long-term critical success. Anyways, I think that's about it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please feel free to leave me feedback on Twitter or Tumblr. Let me know what you liked or didn't like, uh, things you'd like to see on the next one, uh, and hopefully I can make more of these. Uh, thank you very much for your support. I really appreciate it. Uh, have a good day.